She took a vow to walk penniless until mankind had learned peace. This is a real pilgrimage. It's actually a journey on foot. I don't hitchhike. I walk in spite of all the rides that are offered and on faith. I took a vow at the beginning that I would remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace, walking until I am given shelter and fasting until I am given food. And although I have never asked for anything, I can truthfully say that I have been supplied. There's optimism to have faith and then to step out on that faith. It's amazing, it's wonderful, it's inspiring and enheartening. She spoke of peace in a time of war. My vow says I shall remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Now, I am praying for peace in the world, even though I talk mostly about peace within ourselves as a step toward peace in our world. Does anybody who meets you anywhere in your travel think that you're crazy or out of your mind? They don't say so, but they're very curious, of course. After all, what I work for and pray for, world peace, is the desire of every human heart. They're all very much with me. The fact that I have been completely supplied without ever asking for anything indicates uh, how much they're with me and, of course, indicates also how good they are. You know there's good in every human heart, no matter how deeply it may be buried. If you love them and trust them or have faith in the good in them, you reach it. The world is rather like a mirror. If you smile at it, it smiles at you and I love to smile. It began January 1st of 1953. It's my retirement project, and I finished counting the 25,000 miles toward the end of 1964. I have not counted miles since then. miles she walked along with no possessions but the clothes upon her back no money in her pocket yet nothing did she lack nothing did she lack what in our society calls forth a peace pilgrim well don't forget the korean war was on the mccarthy era was at its height there was great fear at that time and therefore great apathy because the safest thing to do is nothing. At any time in any culture where there is great apathy in the face of a crisis situation, a pilgrim is apt to step forth. And a pilgrim's job is to rouse people from their apathy and make them think. Will there be peace or war? The fateful question posed by Warren Austin, head of the United States delegation to the UN, set the mood of the world at the century's halfway mark. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. I have walked 6,900 miles of my 10,000-mile pilgrimage for peace. The cost was high to Americans who bore the brunt under the UN banner. Now, uh, is it true that the House Committee on Un-American Activities is considering an investigation of the clergy? The investigation of communism and communists in this country should take place wherever it be found. Increased range, guided missiles were added to the underseas arsenal, and the submarine became a more formidable weapon of counterattack on enemy coasts. The year had indeed seen a revolutionary step forward in naval warfare and the nation's defense. Now, a pilgrim walks not only prayerfully, but as an opportunity to contact people. And that's why I'm wearing my short tunic with Peace Pilgrim on the front and 25,000 miles on foot for peace on the back, because 
it makes my contacts for me in a very kind way. I don't need to approach people. They approach me. And my message, one sentence, this is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth and hatred with love. You see, it isn't new, just the practice of it would be new. Well, is it uh, very often that you have to go without food or without a bed on these walks? I seldom skip more than three or four meals in a row. I don't even think about food until food is offered. I once had a 45-day period of prayer and fasting. I know how long one can go without food. And even when I'm with total strangers, I have a bed about three quarters of the time. When I don't, I might sleep in a bus station in the city or a truck stop out on the highway. But I have slept on the grass beside the road. I have walked all night to keep warm. If you're concerned, concerned enough about what you're doing. You don't mind any of these little so-called hardships, and I'm very concerned about peace. arithmetic to figure out that if the nations of the world were to stop manufacturing implements of mass destruction, they could provide for every human being who lives in this world the basis for a very good life. After 25,000 miles, she stopped counting but kept walking, focusing on an increasingly full schedule of speaking appearances in schools, churches, colleges, and on radio and television. I walk until given shelter. I fast until given food. I do not ask. These things must be given. And just think without ever asking. These things have been supplied. Aren't people good? Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. Final analysis only as we become more peaceful people will we find ourselves living in a more peaceful world. When I realized what human potential really was, what people really are capable of, I looked around me and I said, How sad that most people only scratch the surface of their real potential. No wonder they have problems. No wonder society has problems. She spoke of universal spirituality before spirituality was in vogue. Aren't they beautiful? I touched God many times as truth. All that intellectually and emotionally, I touched God as love and goodness and kindness and beauty. I felt God through the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. And then reaching out through an awakened divine nature, I was able to perceive God as the ever-present, all-pervading essence or spirit, which binds everything in the universe together and gives life to everything in the universe. Well, she just wasn't a homemaker. That's all there was to it. No way, shape, or form that she was she a homemaker. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a home and family. She loved to dance, I remember that. She had several boyfriends that used to take her down to the piers in Atlantic City and they'd dance. She wouldn't just have dresses and shoes. It would be a coordinated outfit. And then she knows how to pose and turn like uh, Greta Garbo, you know, and all that sort of thing, yeah. Well, I think she was more fashionable than average for a small town. She was actually the first woman ever to hike the uh, entire Appalachian Trail. And I know she used to, when she was in those hiking days, she'd always bring home a couple of like people that she hiked with. She'd always pick up stray people all over the place. She lived very comfortably, but was not happy. Had what she said the world would call success, uh, what the world would think of as having it made, so to speak. But this unrest in her soul and then she had this vision this calling to do this walking for peace and uh, 
she had the struggle inside of herself because she said, why would I leave this? She obviously had beautiful gardens around her home and she loved flowers. But she said, why would I leave this to, to impoverish myself? And she thought, but am I not impoverished where I am? I'm not a happy woman. I'm not what you would call a peaceful woman. My life is full of unrest. I'll give it a try. Where do you think her faith came from? <laughs> but believe me, I don't know. That's just a thing that mystifies me because I won't say that she wasn't a caring person. She was a, uh, not a, uh, an unsympathetic person or anything, but still, I mean, she never, she wasn't too much out of the ordinary as far as, uh, you know, making the sacrifice she did to express our ideas. And I don't know where it came from. She had severed her old relationships. The uh, local people didn't go along with her, family didn't go along with her, and she just brushed that aside. This was more important. Forty years ago, I started what I have come to call a spiritual growing up or a psychological growing up. It takes you from the self-centered life or the life governed by the self-centered nature into the life governed by the nature which is centered in the good of the whole, which sees you as a part of the whole and works for the good of the whole which sees that you're a cell in the body of humanity, that every cell, every human being has, well, equal uh, importance, equal potential, although in varied stages of growth because we choose how much growing we do, and a job to do in the total scheme of things. That was my preparation for the pilgrimage. It took 15 years. Mr. Kennedy presented a manifesto for peace in momentous and moving words. Ladies and gentlemen of this assembly, the decision is ours. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet or together we shall perish in its flames. Save it we can and save it we must and then shall we earn the eternal thanks of mankind, and as peacemakers, the eternal blessing of God. There was a real threat of uh, nuclear war, and, and uh, which would totally destroy the whole world, everything living on it. And here was this woman, this individual, that had the courage to say, no, I am going to promote peace, never mind what other people are doing, never mind what the Soviet Union, uh, how it's threatening us or how we're threatening the Soviet Union with all of those missiles pointed at each other. And here was this woman that was walking her talk, I mean literally walking her talk, and uh, walking across the United States promoting peace. And the thing that, that really was so wonderful about her was that she knew that peace started within us and that it was an individual happening, that it had to happen with individuals one by one by one. And it was so inspiring to me that it, it certainly changed my consciousness, my awareness and the direction that I was thinking and, and certainly changed the activity of mine also. So she was very influential and inspirational in my life at that time. Do you think the world is more at peace now because of your efforts? Well, I, of course, only 
the world is more at peace because of the efforts of all peacemakers put together. Uh, you see, when I started out, why people accepted war as a necessary part of life, but now I'm on the popular side because peace has become a matter of survival, and even the most immature people wish to survive. There is darkness in our world today, yes. It is due to the disintegration of things which are contrary to the divine law of love. But let us never say hopelessly, oh, this is the darkness before a storm. Let us rather say with faith, this is the darkness before the dawn of a golden age of peace, which we cannot now even imagine. For this, let us hope and work and pray. you right. 